blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts, for as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the Proverbs. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity, and the rod of anger will fail. Those who are generous are blessed, for they share the bread, their bread with the poor. Do not rob the poor because they are poor, or crush the afflicted at the gate. For the Lord pleads their cause and despoils of life those who despoil them. The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of James. My brothers and sisters, 
do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into the court? Is it not they who blaspheme and ec the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. 
Jesus set, <clears throat> Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter, and he said to her, Let the little children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephaphatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to thee, O Christ. Please be seated. Good prelude, Marcus. You normally have to have a coronation or a royal wedding for that one. Uh, that's, a, that's good. That's good. Well, slim pickings this morning, but I'm glad that you all are here. Uh, you know, I, I think that we should pass a new rule in the Episcopal Church. I think that we should make it mandatory that every parish in the country has to read through the letter of St. James during election season. Every four years... That's the lessons that we get, is the letter of St. James. Uh, J James has a beautiful way of cutting through to the chase and keeping it in perspective, doesn't he? Uh, it, it is so easy to get spun up during election season, especially in the last few election seasons that we've had. And y'all, it's just not good for us. Uh, it's not good for us as a family, and it's not good for us as a country. But if you read St. James, James helps you quit worrying about everybody else and reminds us, reminds me, to worry about myself because I have plenty to fix uh, within Chad Jones before I get too worried about everybody else. I, you know, I am the world's worst at starting to point my finger. Uh, every time election season rolls around, I get really put out with, with folks who I think are, are big mouth Christians. They, uh, people who tout Christianity, but then they don't really seem to be taking any of their Christian responsibilities seriously. People who cannot seem to get it together, or worse, worse, maybe the worst, the people who, who, who wave the banner of Christianity and it becomes very, very obvious to all of us that they only do that for their own political gain. But then you read James. And James reminds me that when I am the perfect Christian, then I can worry about everybody else. And until then, it's time for me to worry about myself. And as the church, we can all agree that we can work on it individually, that is for sure, and we need to. But as a church, we can also work on it collectively, not just as an I, but as a we uh, in, the, in the world around us. You know, with Christianity on the rise, in almost every country south of the equator, and in some places on the rise in vast, earth-shattering numbers. And on the decline in almost every country north of the equator, and sometimes I mean vast, earth-shattering decline north of the equator, I realize that for us, here north of the equator, the stakes have never, ever been higher for the church. And it's important that we get it right because, as, as Peter says, Satan is prowling around like a ravening lion searching for a soul to devour. And when we do a poor job of modeling a healthy Christian life 
By doing the things that, that St. James talks about, we make it so easy for souls to be devoured. Christians, have you ever thought about that? Christians who are not doing a good job are actually helping Satan fulfill his mission in devouring those vulnerable souls. Every time someone says, see, there's Christianity for you, I don't want any part of that, then we have contributed to the mission of Satan. And I, I sometimes wonder, how in the world can we have all been sitting in church all these years and still get it so wrong so many times, but I do, I, st I still do. You know, how can we not know that this behavior or that behavior, uh, whether, whether we're talking about immoral behavior or self-righteous behavior or unmerciful behavior, or just plain rude, just plain rude behavior is really not allowed for us as Christians. And then my own kids remind me uh, when I get snippy with those insurance companies on the phone, and I always get snippy with insurance companies on the phone, or just walking through Walmart, which is another occasion for sin in my life, just to be in Walmart sends me right over the edge, and they remind me uh, that those are sins too. And, you know, I don't like it when preachers use the pulpit as a confessional. I think that's a little abusive, but there you have it. I just did it, didn't I? Um, it, that's just one on the long list of confessions. I am a terrible sinner when it comes to controlling my temper in Walmart. I just am. But, you know, that is just one of a million things that you have to be careful about in the, in the pulpit. You have to be careful when you're the guy that stands behind the fancy wooden pulpit. Uh, you, you, you cannot use it as the confessional, and you cannot use it as, as a place to do your own therapy session. You, you, you just don't want that priest. You get tired of him in a heartbeat. I think you get tired of a priest for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, you know, you don't want a priest that's overly emotional right? A crying preacher can get old really, really fast, can get on your nerves in a hurry. You want a preacher that's bold, but not too bold, right? Just kind of right in that sweet spot. And a, a boldness in preaching can, can sometimes be a dangerous thing because it's, it's like you're holding yourself up as a moral paragon, and I can promise you one thing, Chad Jones is not a moral paragon. And it's one reason that I admire Billy Graham, Bishop Fulton Sheen, uh, John Claypool, people like that. They never pulled any punches in their preaching. And have, did you notice that nobody ever dug up the first piece of dirt on any of them? And don't you know that Satan would have loved for that to happen? Satan pr was prowling around those great preachers like a ravening lion, and a public fall would have, been, would have done great things for the reign of Satan. Now, I need you to know that as your, your rector, I am far from a moral paragon. I am not Billy Graham. Uh, but I do try to get up and start anew every single day. I, and I try to be bold in my preaching. So as I think about the many people we can name who have proclaimed their faith with boldness, and we can name also quite a few who had a very public and dramatic fall from grace. A lot of times it's preachers. A lot of times it's politicians. And, I, and I, I, I do wonder how they did not know that their behavior was out of bounds for a Christian. You know, see it, we talked about this in Sunday school this morning. C.S. Lewis said that every one of us is born with a standard woven into our souls. He says that that's the standard of knowing right from wrong, that every one of us arrives on this planet knowing somehow between right and wrong. He says that everybody has that, and he points out that one of the first things that little children learn to say is, or if you were in Sunday school, what was it? That's not fair, right? It's one of the first things that a child learns how to, how to say is that is not fair. Children have a very finely tuned sense of equity and fairness, and if you don't believe that, you give one toddler two stickers, and you give another toddler one sticker, and see if you don't hear about it, because you will. Lewis cited that as evidence for the existence of God, that that standard is woven into us. But, you know, the, there are some sins, though, that don't have anything to do with the deeds that we have done, but just in the manner in which we live our lives. The harsh, self-righteous way in which we sometimes speak, that hurts a Christian witness quite badly. How do so many Christians today not know 
that we're never going to further the kingdom of God by being self-righteous or being snarky. And this week I came to a frightened, frightening conclusion, and maybe it's because we're not talking about that. Maybe it's because the church is not teaching that the way we ought to. Maybe it's because we are not taking the gift that is the good news of Jesus Christ and really let that permeate our lives and come out of our lips. You know, I often preach warnings about what will happen to the church when we quit evangelizing, when we neglect evangelism, but I don't often preach about what will happen to the church when we quit discipling. Right? Evangelism comes first, but that is only a first step because discipleship comes after that. So the letter of St. James, which we've been reading now for two weeks, is just as clear as it can be when it comes to Christian behavior. And I went to the lectionary, the, the schedule of readings that we have throughout the year. I went to that this, this, this last week to look for the lessons for today, and I noticed something that bothered me. There are a lot of different options in our lectionary. You know, every week I choose between either this Old Testament lesson or this Old Testament lesson. And we can either say this psalm or we can say this psalm or we can sing one of these canticles. See, there are choices that I make every, uh, every week. And then there are also usually options within the different readings. Uh, you know, some of them would be very, very long if you didn't shorten them some. Uh, for instance, if the gospel lesson has two stories in one, and I'm preaching on the first one, and the second one is optional, sometimes I will leave that out just for the sake of, of brevity. But sometimes the things that they leave out bother the heck out of me. Uh, today's lesson from St. James has an optional part. And I actually left the brackets in your bulletins this morning so you could see what the, what the optional part was. Uh, we usually take those brackets out when we print it, but to call your attention to it, we left them in this time. And let me read to you one of the verses that they, that they left out. I don't know why. It says, So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Why in the name of heaven and earth would that be an optional verse in our scripture? Because the concept, my friends, is not optional. Mercy triumphs over judgment, just right there in black and white. Are Christians across our country embarrassing all of the rest of us because of all the parts that we've made optional in the Bible? I wish some Christians would stop talking until they had gone back and read all of the optional parts, all of those parts that we've been skipping over. I wish they'd go back and read them. And you know what? Maybe it's time for me to go back and read them too. And I think Jesus thought the same thing. There were some people who were just not ready to represent the faith. And you notice after Jesus heals them, he tells them to go away and be quiet. Shh, you are not ready to be representing the rest of us yet. Go away and tell no one what, you, what you've seen. But then when somebody got it, and I mean really got it. Jesus told them to go out and tell everybody they ran into what it was that the Lord has done for them. The Syrophoenician woman that we hear about in the gospel this morning, the Sidonian widow, Mary Magdalene, the woman at the tomb, all of these women got it. They did not omit any of the verses, not one word. And God told them to go out and preach. Tell everybody that you can. Tell them what they know, what you know, and tell them what the Lord Jesus has done for you. So while, while I'm on my soapbox, and I clearly am, why, why is it that it was so many more women than men who were told to go out and preach? Why in the world, in the last 60 years or so, have, have, have men become content to sit back and let women do the hard work of the church? Now, we do, we do fairly well at resurrection that way, but Christianity as a whole is turning into a, into a feminine movement. Gentlemen, do we believe in Jesus or do we not? Are we living lives that will honor Christ? If so, let's get it together and let's start talking and acting like Christians. You know the saying, if you can't walk the walk, then don't talk the talk? You, you all know that saying, you've heard it. Well, I find that a lot of times in the Episcopal Church, that's not the lesson we need to hear. 
a lot of times in the Episcopal Church, we have to turn it around and say, if you are walking the walk, then why are you uncomfortable talking the talk? Tell people what it is the Lord has done for you. Resurrection, I would hold you up as the people who get it. I would hold you up as the people who understand, who have it figured out. Like the good, humble, faithful woman in the gospel today. You are praying, you are doing for, for others, you are begging of the Lord the good things that fall from the table. We know that we are unworthy, but we also know that we have been shown great mercy. And you are capable of showing such great mercy, of doing such good, faithful, James-like works for the poor and the needy and the hungry. Let's not forget to show mercy to the lost. That's our first job, to spread the news of the gospel, but then to disciple them when they get here and show the world what it means to be a Christian who actually does walk the walk while, not, while all the while not being afraid to humbly talk the talk. Go from this place today and tell the world what it is that your Lord Jesus has done for you. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray especially for the Saint, for the Saint Joseph of Arimathea Church, Hendersonville, Daughters of the King of the Diocese of Tennessee, and the Church of the Province of Burma. 
And for those who are on our parish pray list, prayer list, Mary, Dick, Diane, Mary Jane, Betty, Drew, Anne, Arlene, Gianna, Carla, Rick, Nicole, Carlos, Harry, Linda, Sally, Allie, Anne, Maggie, Miriam, Jackie, Barry, David, Lindsay, Cindy, Betty, Tom, Peter, Avery, Duncan, Winnie, Aaron, Everett, and Noel. As well as for those who serve in our country, especially Douglas, Jeffrey, Stephen, Cameron, Jack, John, Kurt, Christy, Christopher, Danny, Tyler, Blake, Maggie, William Patrick, David, Rusty, and Gus. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you unto everlasting life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. All right, I think that we, uh, I think we've got everybody in a Sunday school class. Now, it's been a little more difficult this year than it has been in, uh, in, in years uh, past. Uh, we, I think we've got everybody in a Sunday school class now. We started back up um, uh, the, our, our last class this uh, morning. How did, how did youth go, the, our high school? How did the high school class go? Went fine. And elementary, middle school, that all went okay. I think adults went all right. I think everybody's got a spot for now. Uh, so Wednesday nights, we will start back with family supper and um, youth and children and adults on Wednesday nights on the 18th, Wednesday, September the 18th. Uh, I will remind you, as we discussed last month in Vestry, that the, the Vestry meeting uh, is not tomorrow as it normally would be, but it is the following uh, Monday uh, this month. When I... Uh, went on sabbatical last year. I came back and for the first time in 25 years um, decided to do a show and I caught the bug a little bit so I'm doing one again this year uh, and this is the this is the week so we're pushing that uh, vestry meeting and I appreciate you all for letting me do that. We're pushing that vestry meeting uh, back once and Nick and Lee are in the show this year too with the Franklin Light Opera so uh, we've we've been having a, I wish we had one more week right of rehearsals. I wish we had one more week of rehearsals. But uh, I think it's going to be funny. 
Uh, so anyway, the point of that was we're moving the vestry meeting, and if you have seen the church through the week looking like a bomb has gone off in the parish hall, it's because the Franklin Light Opera rehearses here during the, during the week. They do a pretty good job getting it set back up for Sundays, but I, I think they move out uh, on, uh, on Monday. So if you are a, a newcomer or you're here for the first time in a long time, we are so glad that you are. Reach in front of you to that, uh, to that visitor's card in the, in the pew in front of you and drop, fill that out and drop that in the plate for us. Are there any birthdays this morning? It's Miss Mally's, and today, right? Come on, come on, Miss Mally. And Becky, it's yours too? Today, same as Mally. All right. Grayson, is it yours? Here's today, three today. That's unusual. We would have three on the same day. All right. Watch over your servants, Almighty God, as their days increase. Bless them as they stand. Encourage them uh, when they're sorrowful and when they fall. And on that great last day, bring them to your heavenly country where they, where they will feast forever with your saints in light. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Happy birthday. We love y'all. Uh, any anniversaries? Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice unto God.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This, <laughs> Genevieve, if you having trouble back there? <laughs> it's, the bells died. Genevieve's pushing that button as hard as she can. <laughs> After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. 
Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord, amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you forever. Amen. in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>